And we praise God for his blessings and for his mercies. Um, we are going to do our ninth installment in the Sanctuary series. Today we're going to deal with um, the sanctuary again. Our scripture reading is taken from Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 and 13. And the Bible says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to his works. And they were judged, every man, according to his works. Our message this Sabbath is entitled, Power, Judgment, and Glory. Power, judgment, and glory. The sanctuary, part nine. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, I am unworthy of your mercies and your grace. So, Father God, I ask that you just make me a nail on the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. And upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let me not be seen or heard today. Instead, Father, we need to hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. All right, if you have your Bible, we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. One of the most interesting Old Testament stories, in my opinion. Um, there's a lot to it. I can't get into all of it today. But 2 Samuel chapter 6 gives us a very interesting story. Um, at the time of David. 2 Samuel 6 and verse 1, And again, again David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that, dwell bet that dwells between the cherubims. The Philistines had kidnapped the Ark of the Covenant. They'd taken it and they thought for sure that this thing was like an omen and it would allow them to win battles. The problem is when they took it in among them, what happened? All kind of bad stuff. People started growing tumors and pestilence started breaking out and bad natural disasters. And before it was long, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant was like a hot potato. The Philistines wanted to get rid of it. David had gone now to, to collect the Ark of the Covenant and to bring it back to Jerusalem or bring it to Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting is uh, this, this, this um, desire for the Ark of the Covenant still lives today. In Hollywood, there was a, a pretty famous movie called Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark. That was the Ark of the Covenant that he was supposed to be looking for in that Hollywood movie. It is said that the Nazis, um, during the time of Hitler, were looking for the Ark for the same reason the Philistines wanted it. They believed that wit, and they collected, I don't know if you know, but they collected all kinds of um, supernatural, spiritual paraphernalia from all over the world, thinking that it would all give them a spiritual advantage at war. One of the things they hoped to find, some say, is the Ark of the Covenant. Today, some say the Ark of the Covenant is in a church in Ethiopia. And if you go online and look it up, there's literally a church in Ethiopia where men stand guard with guns and the Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be inside. I think maybe it's a duplicate of the Ark, but I don't think it's the original Ark of the Covenant. The scripture tells us that the Ark was sometimes called by the name of the Lord of hosts, the one that dwells, that sits between the cherubims. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, in verse 3, and they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gabeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. 
And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood and even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. They began to celebrate the return of the ark. They were playing music and everybody was having a good time. It was like a parade and they are, the ark is on the cart and it's being rolled through and Everyone, the music's playing, and we find out later on that David is dancing before the Lord, and everyone is having a wonderful time. Verse 6 says, When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God, and he took hold of it. For the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Now, when I was a teenager, and there's probably a few teenagers in here now, I, they would read these stories in church, and I'd just be flabbergasted. I would just think, man, these, these, this is crazy. The man is trying to steady the ark. It looks like it's probably going to fall, and he's trying to help the ark out, and he gets struck down. And you say to yourself, boy, this, this, is, this is some scary stuff. But there's more to the story than is explained here. Uzzah and all of Israel are disobeying God this entire story. Uzzah and the ark, the oxen shaking it, were never supposed to happen. And so when he reaches out his hand, Bible says God struck him down for his error. Let, let me read the rest of this and we'll get deeper into this. 2 Samuel 6, 8, 9, and 10. And David was displeased. David got upset because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah and he called the name of the place Perizzah to this day. And look at verse 9. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? David was so afraid, he said, listen, stop the parade, turn off the music, DJ, cancel the next song. I don't want this thing coming near me. David began to panic. Look at verse 10. So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obededom, the Gittite, David said, listen, I'm not taking it. And one man took the ark. Let me tell you something. If you don't understand God, you might very well become afraid of him. Not understanding how God works. Let's look at Patriarchs and Prophets, page 705. The fate of Uzzah was a divine judgment upon the violation of a most explicit command. Through Moses, the Lord had given special instruction concerning the transportation of the ark. None but the priests, the descendants of Aaron, were to touch it, look at this, or even to look, uh, look upon it uncovered. The divine direction was, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. That's back in Numbers 4 and verse 15. The priests were to cover the ark, and then the Kohathites must lift up the staves, which we'll explain later, which were placed in rings upon each side of the ark and were never removed. They were never supposed to look at it, never mind touch it. It was never supposed to go on a cart. It was only to be transported by, by the hands of a certain group of men who were of the lineage of, of one man. It was a, a very uh, explicit direction given. To the Gershonites and Merorites who had, who had in charge the curtains and boards and pillars of the tabernacle, Moses gave carts and oxen for the transportation of that which was committed to them. But unto the sons of Kohath he gave none, because the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them was that they should bear upon their shoulders. 
number 79. Thus, in the bringing of the ark from carriage Jerim, there had been a direct and inexcusable disregard of the Lord's directions. David and his people had assembled to perform a sacred work. And they had engaged in it with a glad and willing and glad and willing hearts. But the Lord could not accept the service because it was not performed in accordance with his directions. I want to submit to you that when you call yourself a Christian, you understand that you serve a God of power. He's a God of, of, of order, not of chaos. And when God gives instruction, God means what he says. Now, we live in a world that says, you know what? God doesn't really mean you got to keep the seven-day Sabbath. You could just switch it to another day of the week. You keep Friday or Sunday. I remember there was a church I, I, was, I was doing some, some work with in public health. And they, they said, listen, you got to keep a Sabbath. And they were like, but you just got to pick which day of the week you want to be your Sabbath. So one lady picked Monday. I said, yeah, I'd pick Monday too if I could just pick one, right? Nobody wants to go to work on Monday. But that's not how God works. God's ways are higher than our ways. He understands what we do not understand. He gives what he gives us in instruction for our own protection. Listen, I wish I could go back and tell my teenage self, but following God's ways is the best way. All of the mistakes I've made, all of all the failures uh, that I've had, all of the uh, all of the, the 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 trial I brought upon myself, had I just listened to and followed the instructions of God. Upon Uzzah rested the great guilt of presumption. Transgression of God's law had lessened his sense of, of its sacredness. And with unconfessed sins upon him, he had, in face of the divine prohibition, presumed to touch the symbol of God's presence. God cannot accept, God can accept no partial obedience, no lax way of treating his commandments, by the judgment upon Uzzah, he designed to impress upon all Israel the importance of giving strict heed to his requirements. Thus, the death of that one man, by leading the people to repentance, might prevent the necessity of inflicting judgments upon thousands. When we look at the sanctuary and its message, where the sanctuary leads you, after you leave the holy place is into the most holy place and what you have to do to get from the holy place to get to this this ark that we were just talking about that is so powerful that when a man touched it he died is you've got to go through the veil now this is an artist rendition an adventist artist rendition of the veil there would have been cherubims on it it was made with many beautiful colors um in fact the jewish historian josephus says that the veil between the holy place and the most holy place was four inches thick. He says that if you put a horse on each corner of the veil and had the horses run in separate directions, the horses could not rip the veil. The veil was an incredible piece of tapestry that hung from four posts. And each of those posts, just as we talked about before, was made of acacia wood covered in gold. But the, but the actual sockets in which they sat were silver, which we remember we said the silver sockets re represent redemption. And so from this hung this incredible tapestry that did not reach the ceiling of the sanctuary so that there are certain aspects of what was going on inside. They couldn't, you couldn't stand on the outside and see the Ark of the Covenant but when we get to the Shekinah glory of God, you could be on the holy side and look up through the space and see the presence of God. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say what? His flesh. What does the veil represent? Christ's flesh. Ah, don't miss this thing. That's why a four inch wide veil that Josephus says four horses couldn't rip into pieces. When Jesus died on the cross, when his flesh was taken and beaten, and when he finally died on the cross, what happened to the veil? 
It was ripped from the top to the bottom. You got to get the significance of this. That means that when it was ripped, Christ being his flesh being the veil that separated those around him from the divinity that was within him. And remember when he went on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, uh, Peter describes when, it, when the divinity flashes through that, the, that it was like, 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 it came, like the Shekinah glory came through Jesus. When he died on the cross, he opened the way to God. This is why we don't sit in confessional booths. This is why we don't ask priests for blessings and favors. This is why our sins, we don't have to pay an indulgence to have them removed. All we have to do because the veil of the flesh of Christ has been broken, had been, had been torn. All we have to do is petition God directly. A way was made for us. And let me tell you something, this holiday season, as everyone is talking about, um, you know, presents and the commercialization of Christmas, understand that a free gift was given us. That we can now approach the throne of God. But what happened inside the veil? Well, judgment happens inside the veil. And this, as we've been talking about the sanctuary message, we'll do a little recap in a minute, but as we talked about it, this is what it all leads to. You start in the outer court, there's the, there's the brazen altar there, the, the sacrifice, the daily sacrifices are made, but that transfers the sin only from the person onto the sanctuary. At some point, the sin in the sanctuary has to be removed. Judgment takes place at that point. Here's what Peter says. 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Here's a, here's a, here's a tough verse. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? When I was growing up, I thought that judgment was something to be afraid of. I thought at Faith Church, when we'd have these great talks, and people like Pastor Saunders would, would give us these lessons, I thought I should be afraid of the judgment. But you know what my studies have shown me? That when you have gone through the process of the sanctuary, meaning that you have been justified in the courtyard, that meaning you have done the work of sanctification in the holy place. We've talked about this, right? When you get to the point where glorification is to happen, that's when judgment happens. That's what happens in the most holy place. When you get to that point, if you've gone through the process, judgment is the best thing that can happen to you. That's why Peter says, judgment begins with us. Huh. Because judgment isn't a bad thing, not something to be afraid of. Judgment begins with us. That's why he says, if the righteous scarcely be saved, saved first. Huh. Here's what Jesus says. Revelation 22, 12, John the Revelator writing. He says, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is what? It's with me. To give every man according as his what? As his work shall be. Judgment begins in the house of God because it's the people of God who get the reward first. Now here's where it gets interesting. So the most holy place, we talked about this before, the most holy place is a perfect cube, remember? It's two-thirds of the sanctuary is the, is the holy place. The last third is the most holy place. It is a perfect cube in height, uh, length, and, 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 and breath. Perfect cube. The only other thing in the Bible that, or one of the only other things in the Bible that is a perfect cube is the New Jerusalem as described in the book of Revelation. What we are seeing is that we, when, you, when, you, when judgment happens, we are entering into a sphere of perfection. The Christian is different when he is saved because we are not looking to get the reward of punishment, but we are going to get a different reward eternal life. And this is why the sanctuary message is so important. Because when you begin to peel back the layers, what you understand is we are living right now in the time of judgment. So let's look at the, the furniture in there. First piece, or uh, the main piece, of course, is the Ark of the Covenant. 
Um, this is an artist rendition of it. It would have been a, 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 an incredible work of art. Um, it, is, it, is a, it is actually two pieces, not one. The bottom piece is a, like a chest. And it was designed as the Ark of the Testimony because it was designed and is the first thing God told Moses to, to, have, make, to, to have made. And in it sat what? The Ten Commandments. It was designed to house the Ten Commandments. That's the main part, the, the bottom, which is open. The lid is actually different. You see, the bottom is made from acacia wood, just like the rest of the much of the sanctuary, and covered in gold. But the lid was made of solid gold. The lid had a different name. It was called the mercy seat. And what that means uh, and what it trans uh, equates to is this was the throne of God on earth. God sat on the mercy seat. Here's where it gets deep. So uh, in the in the, in the ark is the Ten Commandments. We'll get more into this in a second. But upon the top sat God. So as we're going to talk about, when God is in the uh, most holy place, He's sitting on the mercy seat. As you can see here, there are Moses was instructed to, to replicate what was what we would see in heaven, and that is that there are two angels on either end, and what and with it they cover almost their faces. Their faces are facing down uh, towards the, the the Ten Commandments, and their wings are used to shield each other. Exodus twenty five and verse twenty one, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark. Thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. That's the Ten Commandments. 22, and there I will meet with you. What is God going to do at the, at the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat? He's going to meet with you. He is going to tabernacle with you. The purpose of the sanctuary message is that we meet with God. And there I will meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So this was the place God was to meet with his people. This is why only the priests could look on it or touch it. This is why Uzzah's sin was so great, because he was literally reaching out. Remember, when Moses wanted to see God, he had to turn his back, uh, you know, and, 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 and God turned his back and moved across. Had Moses seen God face to face or, or the rest of Israel, death would have broken out. So the mercy seat sits on top. The ark is on the bottom. The purpose was to carry the Ten Commandments. And this was God's throne on earth. That only the descendants of Kohath were to carry the ark. And it was, remember, we, we talked about it initially, it was Bazaleel, who was the great um, um, artist and, and, and craftsman who God's spirit was on, who he, all the other things, he, some of the other things he was able to give other people to do, he made the ark of the covenant his own masterpiece. So what went inside? Well, we talked about this, the tables of stone, Exodus 25 and verse 16. And thou shalt put in the ark of the testimony, which I shall give thee. So, the, so, the, so the, the Ten Commandments sit inside the ark. And one of the reasons this is important is because there are a lot of people who tell you that the Ten Commandments have been done away with. Have you ever heard that? They say, you know, you don't need to keep the seven day Sabbath because the, the commandments have all been done away with. You don't you don't have to do it. In fact, uh, they say, you know, in Colossians, it says that the, the, the law was nailed to the cross. How easy is it to nail stone to something? Remember, we talked about in Deuteronomy, the Ten Commandments were written with God's finger. There are only three times in the Bible when God writes. We talked about all three times. The first time was when he wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. So what was actually nailed to the cross? This is important. The sanctuary message helps us to understand all a lot and all of our doctrine. Why do we, as Seventh-day Adventists, still keep the seven-day Sabbath when the majority of Christians no longer keep it? Well, what they will tell you is that they keep Sunday now, that the law was nailed to the cross, we know that it was actually the papacy who transferred the solemnity from the seventh day of the, of the week to the first day of the week. And this happened as the pagans were beginning to flood into the church and they wanted to make the church grow. 
they lowered the standard. They turned the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, into a day of fasting. And the first day of the week was turned into a day of feasting. And so people began to have an affinity for the first day of the week. And eventually they transferred it and said, because Jesus rose on, on the first day of the week, the first day of the week is now the Sabbath. But this is not biblical. This is not in scripture. What was actually nailed to the cross? Deuteronomy 31, 26 Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Now, Moses wrote the, a law, but it was the law that pertained to the theocracy. It to pertain to the festivals and the feasts. This is why we don't keep the feasts anymore. This is why there's uh, we don't circumcise, you don't have to circumcise uh, everyone anymore. All of these things are gone away with. They were nailed to the cross. Colossians 2.14 tells you exactly what was nailed to the cross. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. These things pointed forward to Christ's first coming, to his resurrection, to his death and resurrection, I should say. That's what they did. So they served no more purpose once Christ came, died, resurrected, and ascended. That's what was nailed to the cross. God is just as particular, church, today as he was when Uzzah reached out his hand. The problem is that there are many who are trying to steady things for God. Uzzah wanted to steady the ark. There are many trying to steady things for God. Let me tell you something. The God that we serve has given us what we need in his scripture. Now, what was the other thing that was in the ark? Well, the pot of manna. So inside was also a pot of manna. Manna was the bread that fell from heaven. Um, it was angel's food. It was sweet, like coriander, they says. And it was, they, would buy, they would take it and make all kinds of things. In Exodus 16, 32, and Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commands. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it before the Lord to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. So the commandments were in the ark. The pot of manna. Why was this put in the ark? It was put in the ark so that they would always remember that God provides. God will supply your needs. Can you imagine in a desert where there was no food, very little water, they'd just come out of a bustling um, metropolis in Egypt, or a, a, a bustling society, and now they have nothing. They can't just run to, to Walmart and get food, and they can't just go through the drive through and what does God do for them? He allows food to rain down from heaven. They weren't always going to need this. So what does God do? He says, take it, put it in a golden pot and keep it before the Lord. They would always be able to remember that no matter what happens, God will provide. Let me tell you something. I've experienced this myself. Many of you know, some of you know my mother who grew up with us, so you know my mother and my mother was a single mother, and she had three boys, which was, I can't even imagine, as I look back on my life, how in the world my mother managed feeding and clothing three of us at the time when she had to, by herself. I really can't understand it. I remember, I tell this story in my sermon sometimes, I remember there was a, a week when, a month I should say, when my mother had run out of money before she ran out of month. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And she was in, we were, we, 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 she, she, the budget had been depleted. She was actually a good person. I used to help her with the numbers and the budget. She was good at it. But, you know, if some unforeseen bill, something happened, and we had no idea how we were going to get through the rest of that month. Particularly, my mother couldn't buy groceries. We never took government assistance. Never, none of my mother would not do that. She would work an extra job. She would do whatever it took. She, we never, she never did. She was, a, she bought her own house. She, she did well. 
And she took, I remember myself and my brothers, and we, and, and we went into our family room in our little house, and we all got on our knees, and we began to ask God to provide. We began to pray and ask God to make up what was lacking. And while we were still praying, church, I remember the doorbell on that little house rang. My mother made sure we finished praying before we went to the door. And when we got to the door, there was no one there. But when we looked down on the porch of our, the front porch of our house, house is still there on Tyler Street in Bloomfield, there were bags of groceries. You know what I've learned in dealing with the God of heaven? That there's still manna in the pot. I know life gets difficult and it seems you won't be able to make it, but I want to challenge you. And this is why the sanctuary, these messages, the, uh, the, the, the lessons, I should say, are so potent. Because you're going to reach a time when it seems like there's just not enough, like, 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 like God can't provide. I want to remind you of the manna in the pot. The last thing inside the ark was Aaron's rod that budded. Number 17, and it came to pass on the morrow. So there was a whole fight as to who should be the leader. And all 12 tribes wanted to be represented as a leader. And so Moses had them, God instructed Moses to have them each take up a, 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 a rod and write the name of the leader of their, of their tribe. So for the Levites, Aaron wrote his name. And so they put it in the, in the, before the Lord overnight and left it. And Moses came to, it, and it came to pass that on the morrow, the next day, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, this is the sanctuary, and behold, watch this, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was what? It budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded what? Almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel. And they looked and took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token. Watch this. Against the rebels. And thou shalt uh, quit take, quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not. Now, they wanted to know who should be the leader. They each put in a rod and only Aaron's rod budded. After it budded, they took it and put it also in the Ark of the Covenant. It was a reminder, watch this church, not to rebel against God. Now, so there's three things in the Ark, the Ten Commandments, which were broken. In fact, this wasn't the first set of Ten Commandments in the Ark. It was the what? The second set, because Moses sl body slammed the first one. When he found out they were down there uh, having a party while he was up in the mountain. The second thing that goes in is the manna. But even the gift of manna that was given to them, what did they do to, about it? They murmured and complained. And the third thing that was put in it was Aaron's budding rod, which on the one hand is a symbol that God chooses his leadership and directs his people, but it also showed that his people are rebellious. All of that. So, Think about it. Each thing represents a good. It also represents the failure of God's people. So then what does God do? He covers it. He covers it with the mercy seat. So one last thing on the, on, on the rod that budded. It represents Christ as our high priest. If Aaron was chosen, the rod forever represents that Christ is our high priest. And it speaks against rebellion. So here's what's interesting. When God sat on the mercy seat to look down at these things where God had failed him, he had to look through the blood that was sitting on the mercy seat. In other words, the blood separated God uh, or us from the consequences that God would have had in our failures. So every year on the Day of Atonement, as they went in and did this, it was also a reminder that they had failed in not sinning. They had failed um, in not being grateful for what God had done for them. And they had failed in rebelling against God. Yet God covered that with mercy. 1 Corinthians 15 gives you another meaning 
to the budding rod. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. What did the rod, what came on the rod? What, what fruit, as it were, it's really a nut, but an almond. The almond was the first uh, fruit to bud and it budded early in the morning. It is a symbol, not just of what we just discussed, it is also a symbol of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here you see it. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. I don't want you to miss this. That budding rod represents that Jesus rose from the grave. But here's where it gets even deeper. It also represents that one day the dead in Christ will rise from the grave. The almond was the first one to bud. This is what it represents. And let me tell you something. You know, last month I, um, was the anniversary of my mother's death and of her birth. She was born in November and died in November. And it is, it's always difficult. You have these moments where you stop and you, you think about, you know, what would have been had my mother lived longer. She died very young. But in my mind is, I'm always, I'm reminded of the promises I've been given in Scripture. You see, I don't, unlike others, I have hope because I know I can see my mother again. I know at the resurrection, I will see my mother again. And so the budding rod, if when I'm sad, one of the things that I can reflect on is that there was a Aaron's budding rod, which represents that Christ is our high priest who was raised from the dead and took the death and the grave captive. The reason we as Adventists, remember all our doctrines are in here, the reasons we as Adventists don't believe that my mother is in heaven looking down on us now is because the Bible teaches that she will be among the fruit that rise when Christ come again. My mother would not be happy in heaven looking down at her sons and all the mess we make and problems we wouldn't. My mother's asleep in Jesus, the Bible teaches. Inside was the Shekinah glory of God. The Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So on the top. So, you know, um, when Indiana Jones and the, our lost ark, when they try to do this, they try and reproduce this. They, they mess it all up. But the truth of the matter is Hollywood doesn't understand what God is. God would sit in a cloud here. And when it was time for them to move, the cloud would rise above the entire sanctuary and begin to tell them which direction to go. I want to challenge you to have the Shekinah glory of God in your life and in your heart so that God directs you. So we walked all the way through the sanctuary. We went through the altar of burnt offerings, the brazen laver. We've talked about the table of showbread, the golden lampstand. The altar of incense, we're here now in the Ark of the Covenant. And the purpose of all of that was so that there would be a day of atonement. When all of this would be cleansed. And you can read Leviticus chapter 16 to find out what had to happen. The priest did not wear his normal robes at the bells on the bottom. He put on white linen. He had to wash and put on white linen. He had to kill a bullock uh, and a goat to, for, to take care of his own sin before he could go in. Then they would take two goats, remember and they would draw lots on the two goats. And the one that drew the Lord's lot is the one that went in and was sacrificed. And his blood was sprinkled seven times on the altar. And there was another goat that the scripture calls the scapegoat. And on this goat was laid the sin. And then a strong man took that goat out into the wilderness and let it go. And it carried away the sins. And the sanctuary was cleansed. This happened every single year. It happens even today in Jewish uh, tradition. They still have Yom Kippur. But we have a different lesson. Daniel 8, and verse 14 says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days 
Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. In the book of the, in the, book of the Great Controversy, page 422, it says, It was seen also that while the sin offering pointed to Christ as a sacrifice, and the high priest represented Christ as a mediator, the scapegoat typified who? Satan. You ever wonder why when you watch like rock and roll stuff and satanic stuff, why the symbol is always a goat? Here's the Bible's telling you. Satan is mocking this part of the Bible story of the scapegoat that, that the sin is going to be placed on for all eternity. The author of sin upon whom the sins of the truly penitent will finally be placed. When the high priest, by virtue of the blood of the sin offering, removed the sins from the sanctuary, he placed them upon the scapegoat. When Christ, by virtue of his own blood, removes the sins of his people from the heavenly sanctuary at the close of his ministration, he will place them upon Satan, who in the execution of the judgment must bear the final penalty. The scapegoat was sent away into a land not inhabited, never to come again into the congregation of Israel. So will Satan be forever banished from the presence of God and his people, and he will be blotted from existence in the final destruction of sin and sinners. Did you all get that? Satan himself will one, be one day be destroyed. You know what the devil likes to do? Satan actually means the accuser. So what he does is he's constantly reminding you of where you failed. And you've heard me say this before. When the devil reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. So we know that this plays out prophetically. I can't get into this. We'll do another thing on prophecy later on, but I just want to tie this into the sanctuary as we close. If you take the 2300-day prophecy from the, from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, it ends in 1844. This is the time that we call what was the great disappointment. But also, when you look at these prophecies from Dan, the book of Daniel, we understand why the wise men were able to find Jesus. You see, Daniel came, lived where the wise men probably came from. They probably still had the holy writings and were able to understand them. And they knew that it was only 70 weeks. So at the time of Jesus' birth, which would be back in here somewhere, they knew they had to begin to look for a king because it was, the time was coming for him to be anointed Messiah, which happened in AD 27. So maybe, you know, 27, 28, 30 years before they started looking. This time is coming. They began to look for the star. We'll talk about that Christmas day. And they started to look for the star. And the prophecies were exact. If you wonder about being a Christian, study the book of Daniel and its prophecies. They are so precise that they predict exactly in the middle of the week that the Messiah would be cut off. Jesus was crucified. Which means they are accurate when they predict that an investigative judgment would begin in 1844. That we now live in the time of that judgment. And you can see all of the, the imagery from all of this. It is profound. And if you don't understand this, we should have Bible study. Because I'm telling you, as the time of trouble comes, you will not be persecuted for truth you don't understand. You will give up and move on if you don't understand these truths. If you really don't have a good grasp of why we believe these things and what actually happened, get the Bible study and begin to understand it. It is critical. I hope you can see what's happening in the world. Every day on my phone, the Apple News, it's, it's depressing. Somebody else killed like two people, three people. Someone drove a car into a crowd of kids in California this week, hit a bus. I mean, I could just go on and on. It's just constant. Terrible things happening. And here's what the scripture teaches us, that God will eventually cut this thing short. In his mercy, he will not allow the world to go on like this. And so, the time of judgment is coming. I'll read through those verses and we're done. Acts 17, 31 says, Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. Christ raised from the dead to be our judge. Acts 24, 25, when Paul is talking to Felix, he, and, and Paul, the Bible says, as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix did what? He trembled. Judgment is coming. 
Romans 10, 14, 10 through 12. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught with thy brother? For we shall stand before we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to who? To God. One day I, Eric Walls, will have to stand before God and give an account of myself. And guess what? I don't want to give an account of myself. Because if I look back at my life, I'd fail the test. Huh. Psalms 51 is where you have to go to to understand how you're going to deal with the judgment. I said the judgment's a good thing. Psalm 51 and verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Do what? Blot out my transgressions. Isaiah 43 and verse 25, I, even I, am he that blots out your transgressions for mine own sake and will not do what? He says, I will not remember your sins. It's as if you never sinned. Acts 3.19, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be what? Blotted out. So when I start to worry about what I did and look back on my life, I can go to the scripture and remember that I have all I need. Righteousness is by faith. Why? Because when I trust that the blood of Christ does what it's meant to do. It has washed away my sin. My sins have been blotted out of the book of works. Revelation 20, 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Let me tell you something. The day comes when we each stand before God and have to give an account. And here's the problem. As the most secret dark thoughts begin to come across what would be like a giant movie screen. And the whole universe sits in, uh, uh, in attendance. I can imagine that when my turn comes and, and it says Eric Walsh and, my, and I, I come up and you see me as a cute little baby. And my life begins to play. If I didn't know Christ, I'd get worried on that day. But what happens is quickly, the screen goes blood red. Jesus steps forward and says, I have covered his sins. They have been blotted out of the book of works. And his name has been written in the book of life. Daniel 12 and verse 1. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. Every one that shall be written in the book. Revelation 20 and verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let me tell you something. You know what you, the, the, the real purpose of life is? It's not to get Maseratis and Maybachs and mansions and, 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 and to have billions of dollars in Bitcoin or, or money in the bank. The purpose of life, you have a short time to get your name written in the book of life. When, when it's all said and done, my Bible teaches that even the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nothing's going to be left. If your name's not written, we have, we have a cousin that Played in the NFL. Two cousins played in the NFL. One of them has a Super Bowl ring. The other one has a national championship ring. I've talked about them before. Amazing accomplishments. But guess what? When Jesus returns, and when, especially at the time when the earth is cleansed, every Super Bowl ring, every, every Stanley Cup from hockey, every award and trophy, every plaque on every wall, every diamond studded ring and watch, all of it will melt. If your name's not written in the book of life, none of it will matter. You see, I have hope that I'll see my mother again because she may not have died with a whole lot, but her name was written in the book of life. Revelation 22, 11, 12 promises this. You see, in the heavenly sanctuary, the day is going to come when Jesus 
takes off those priestly robes. And he's going to put on his kingly robes. And as he does this, this is what will be heard as he leaves from judging and redeeming and goes to the act of reconnaissance as he comes to get his own. He says, as probation closes, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he which is righteous, let him be righteous still. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. The day comes when there's no more appeal songs sung. The day comes when there's no more come to Jesus moments. The day comes when it is eternally too late. He <laughs> that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Ah, but he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. The choice is yours and mine. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 705. Feeling that his own heart was not wholly right with God, David, seeing the stroke upon Uzzah, had feared the ark, lest some sin on his part should bring judgments upon him. But Obed-Edom, though, though he rejoiced with trembling, welcomed the sacred symbol as the pledge of God's favor to the obedient. The attention of all Israel was now directed to the Gittite and his household. All watched to see how it would fare with them. Look at this last line. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Let me tell you something. You do not need to be afraid of God. When you take God into your heart, when you make him a part of your life, blessings come. Let me tell you something. I've been in situations when everybody else is panicked and terrified. And I have the assurance of Christ. Patients about to die on me, laying on the table, everyone running frantically. And I simply whisper a prayer to God. Calm comes over me. And I have seen patients that are flatlined come back. Because in the sanctuary is power, there's glory. But church, there's also judgment. And this Sabbath, I challenge you, as this year ends, do not let this year finish and you've not made a decision to follow Jesus Christ all the way. He's a merciful God. He's a good God. And he is a soon-to-return king. Right now, I believe in the heavenly courts, they are preparing for his return. Somebody's got his kingly robes ready. The white horse that Revelation says he will ride back to earth, it's being prepared. Pretty soon, heaven is going to be emptied out. Every angel is going to leave and they're going to return to this earth to collect my mother and my grandmother and my aunts and my grandfather and by God's grace to collect me and my family and my children. By God's grace, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. The question, church, is will you be ready? Our prayer is that we all be ready. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. You are a good and merciful God. For your mercy truly does endure forever. And Father God, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For the signs of your soon return are all around us. I pray now, Lord, as we've gone through the entire sanctuary, I pray, Father God, that as we've learned these truths, we apply them to our hearts, knowing that we have a high priest who's working on our behalf, that we need no intermediate, no saint, no priest. We can call on the name of Jesus and he will hear. Father God, bless your people. The Lord, we would be ready for what is coming upon the earth and to be able to stand in the day of judgment. It's our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.